Well, hello everybody. My name is Mirvat Al Asnaj. I'm an interventional cardiologist at King Fahad Armed Forces Hospital in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And with me is the director of the uh, cardiac center at King Fahad Armed Forces Hospital, Dr. Khaled Shabi. Welcome. Thank you. And hello to uh, all the viewers of Radcliffe Cardiology. We're here to cover the uh, interventional trials, the late breaking interventional trials presented at ACC 2023 in New Orleans here. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the first trial, Dr. Shabi, which was really the Renovate Complex PCI trial. Now this was a, an investigator initiated open label randomized trial that enrolled about 1,200 patients and they were randomized to either intracoronary imaging guided PCI or angiography guided PCI. And the intracoronary imaging was um, left to the discretion of the operator, either IVUS, which ended up being 75% of the patients approximately, and OCT, approximately 25%. And the primary endpoints were a composite, really, of cardiac death, tar clinically driven target vessel revascularization, and then target vessel-related myocardial infarctions. So what were the primary results of this trial, Dr. Shabi? So, so as you pointed out, the primary endpoint was a composite of cardiac uh, death, target vessel MI, and target vessel revascularization. Uh, the endpoint uh, was... Uh, uh, occurred in 12.3% uh, of the angio-guided group compared to only 7.7% of the uh, uh, intracoronary imaging guided group with a p significant p-value of 0.008. Uh, so again, uh, adding to the data that we have showing superiority of imaging guided, intracoronary imaging guided PCI compared to angio-guided PCI. Now, the trial focused on complex PCI, and they defined complex PCI um, very specifically. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, actually, yes. 55% of uh, patients uh, in, enrolled in the study turned out to have long lesions uh, over 38 millimeters in length. Uh, around a quarter of them had true bifurcation lesions, around 12% had uh, unprotected left main PCI, and around 15% had highly calcified lesions required modification. So yes, these would be, by all accounts, considered a, a complex group of patients which are treated. So what are your takeaway from this trial, Dr. Shabi, for practice and guidelines? Well, again, I think this is the first trial that actually showed a, uh, an overall mortality benefit. This was discussed in the, uh, 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 after the presentation by the commentators. Uh, actually, a, uh, the uh, cardiac death uh, rate was 2.4% in the angio-guided group versus 1.7% in the imaging-guided group. That's actually a 50% re relative risk reduction. And they asked why they thought that happened. And uh, the belief is this, this was a complex group of patients. Uh, it was a much larger uh, study than any prior uh, imaging-guided versus angio-guided studies were performed, and for a much longer duration of follow-up. Yeah, so this was done exclusively in South uh, Korea, where they're very um, uh, experienced with intracoronary imaging. I wonder how it would pan out globally uh, in the rest of the world. But perhaps we should move on to another very important uh, interventional trial really related to coronary arteries, and it was the um, BioVASC trial, which looked at um, patients with multivessel disease presenting with acute coronary syndromes. Again, this was a prospective randomized trial uh, using the Orsiro uh, stent. And with it, uh, the most important exclusion criteria here were patients who had ACS and cardiogenic shock or chronic total occlusions, prior cabbage or PCI within the last 30 days. Um, it was a non-inferiority design, and what they looked at is a composite of all-cause mortality, non-fatal uh, myocardial infarctions, and unplanned ischemia-driven revascularization. So, Dr. Shabi, very important that we looked at, they, this study looked at acute coronary syndrome specifically. So, was there a big difference between those who presented with STEMI and those with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction? They didn't really present that data. What they did present was 40% 40, 40 of the study population the clinical indication was primary PCI for a STEMI, while 53% of the study population uh, was for non-STEMI, but they didn't uh, break down the results by presentation, actually. And so the overall uh, outcomes that were reported in terms of the primary outcome, uh, what were those? Well, again, uh, 
the uh, primary impact to me, to myself, is a little bit of a surprise. I thought there'd be no difference between immediate complete versus uh, staged complete. But in fact, uh, when you looked at the primary endpoint, which, as you said, was a non-inferiority design, trying to demonstrate that immediate uh, complete revascular was non-inferior to a staged procedure, and the, 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 it was all-cause mortality, non-fatal MI, and unplanned ischemia-driven revascularization. That occurred in 9.4% of the staged PCI and only 7.6% of complete uh, revascularization at the initial at the time of the index procedure. So a p-value for non-inferiority of 0 0.001. Since it met the non-inferiority standard, they did do a superiority analysis, but it didn't reach statistical significance for that. Although when you look at the secondary endpoints, I think they're quite provocative in the fact that spontaneous myocardial infarctions, type 1 MIs, tended to occur more frequently in those with a staged complete revascularization strategy, 4.3%, compared to 1.9% in those who had an, Im an immediate uh, complete revascularization with a p-value of 0 0.005. Uh, so I, th I thought that was really uh, quite interesting. Agree. That is an important signal. And perhaps in the future, we need to filter out those whom we need to revascularize sooner than later and um, wonder if there are any intracoronary imaging features or so on. I know this trial didn't actually look at it. Actually, uh, yes, that's a very important point because this was again brought up in the discussion after the late-breaking clinical trial. This was a European study where the penetration of intracoronary imaging is very low. Uh, and uh, you wonder, uh, was this excess of M MIs that occurred in the interval between the primary index procedure and the stage procedure due to non-recognition of the true culprit or the fact that there were multiple culprits or thin, uh, thin cap fibrous atheroma there that were susceptible to rupture in, the, in that uh, time period. So I think, yes, this study did not address this because imaging was not used, but certainly it's provocative and you wonder if intracoronary imaging, especially with OCT, would have made a difference in being able to select out those patients who would have benefited from an earlier strategy. Yeah, I, I, I do agree. The signal warrants further uh, uh, workup. But now let's uh, shift gear and move to the structural heart space. And I think one of the most important trials that came out yesterday actually was the Triluminate trial, uh, which is a landmark randomized trial looking at transcatheter therapy for tricuspid valve um, repair, edge-to-edge -edge repair in those with severe uh, disease. And um, it was a randomized trial against medical therapy alone, um, and approximately 350 patients were enrolled. Mean age was 78, and of whom about 55% were women. So the results here were interesting, Dr. Shabi. Firstly, what were the endpoints that they were evaluating in this study, and then what were the outcomes? Well, the, it was a, a composite hierarchical uh, endpoint. So the composite included all-cause mortality, tricuspid valve surgery, rate of heart failure hospitalization, and a quality of life improvement uh, uh, as, uh, survey of the patients. So, so it was a composite. And the, the study actually met its primary endpoint, uh, that is uh, the composite, but the, the, it met it primarily, uh, that was driven by the uh, quality of life improvement that was reported uh, and not by any of the harder endpoints. So tell us a little bit more about the quality of life and how the des study design was um, looked into uh, assessing quality of life in this study. Uh, well, it's used the Kansas City Qu uh, Quality of Life uh, uh, survey, survey uh, and uh, used a 15 point improvement over baseline uh, as the cutoff. Uh, and as I said, that was the main driver for the difference in outcome between the clip arm and the guideline directed that was medical the therapy. Arm. That was the but primary the endpoint. But then again, these patients were not blinded, so they knew that had, they'd had a successful procedure. And I would have liked to see in the secondary endpoints a, collabor a, collabor a collaboration of that subjective reported improvement in quality of life on the six minute walk test. But yet there was no difference between the two groups on the six minute walk test. So you wonder if there was a bit of a psychological impact there that led patients who had active treatment to, to feel or to, to, uh, to make a positive statement on the quality of life survey. Absolutely. So I think overall the heart failure admissions and mortalities um, did not really change with uh, transcatheter therapies, just subjective quality of life. But then this was a very sick population of patients. They were older, about mean age of 78, uh, chronic kidney disease in about 35% and so on.
Again, yeah, I think that's true. And what, another important fact is that uh, uh, this is a relatively small group of patients, only about 300 patients, and a relatively short duration of follow-up of one year. So I, I really think the take-home message is we have a technology now that is safe, uh, reduces uh, tricuspid regurgitation significantly, and the results are sustained out to one year. Uh, the fact that we didn't reach hard endpoint differences between the two may be more of a matter related to the number of patients which are randomized and the duration of follow-up. And I think I, I look forward to seeing more studies with a larger patient population and longer study follow-up to demonstrate uh, uh, more, hard, uh, more hard endpoints, really, because yeah. the, the therapy is effective in reducing TR. And perhaps earlier recruitment of these patients. So another trial, but this time looking at the mitral valve, a landmark trial, the co-op trial, looked at cardiovascular outcomes in mitral clip uh, patients with functional mitral regurgitation. Um, and we have the five-year outcomes here. So what do we take away from the co-op five-year data that was there any difference compared with the initial data that was presented um, for the co-op trial? Well, again, uh, th this was, the, I think the take home message I got from here is we know that the initial COAP trial showed that uh, uh, death or heart failure hospitalization uh, was uh, superior in those patients who were clipped with a mortality uh, benefit. But what I didn't know is that crossover was not allowed by protocol for the first two years. After the first two years, crossover was allowed and in fact occurred in about half of the patients that were originally designated to have guideline-directed medical therapy. And if you look at the curves of the primary endpoint of heart failure and death after the two-year landmark analysis, when crossover was allowed, you find that there is no longer that separation we initially saw. So it seems like those patients who crossed over to CLIP therapy uh, are, actually got the benefit of the clip and therefore their hospitalization rate and de death rates uh, uh, were uh, positively uh, impacted. What Im well, another important thing I think that uh, uh, I uh, got from this five-year analysis is the extremely high death rate at five years for both groups. It was substantially lower in the CLIP group, 57% versus 67%, a 30% relative risk reduction, 10% 10, 10 absolute risk reduction. But still, to have a mortality of 57 or 67% at five years tells you this yeah. is a, a disease we still need to get a handle on and we need better therapies to address the underlying myocardial dysfunction. It is a high risk population and the mortality rate is high knowing that these patients are on a background of guideline-directed medical therapy, so they are already given but the again, benefit of the, it. A lot of these patients uh, in, in, uh, in COAPT uh, were not on drugs that we are now using routinely, such as uh, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin, entresto. A lot of these were more on the baseline ARB, ACE, beta blocker type therapies. And, uh, so it would be interesting may, yeah. to see in the next few years what the uh, co-op profile will look like on more current regimens. And finally, the last trial was the Evolute Low uh, Risk trial, which was looking at transcatheter versus surgical uh, aortic valve replacement in low-risk patients and the three-year outcomes. Um, now, we know that 96.4% in the TAVR arm and 91.2% in the surgical arm um, at three years uh, in favor of TAVR. Uh, was the uh, endpoints and the all-cause mortality and stroke was the primary endpoint here. So what are your take out, uh, take home uh, from that? Well, again, uh, for even at one year, uh, TAVR seemed to have an edge over SAVR, even in this low-risk population, regarding the primary endpoint of all-cause mortality uh, and stroke. And over the ensuing three years, uh, these curves continue to diverge. So uh, TAVR continues to show an increasing edge over surgical aortic valve replacement as far as all cause death and stroke. Uh, what and about other, differences. Imp yeah, other important endpoints such as pacemakers and AFib and so on? W well, again, uh, it's not a surprise. The rate of permanent pacemaker implantation was higher even from the t initial time of implantation in the Evolute group compared to the surgical group. But again, you need to qualify with that. At the time this was done, the method by which these Evolute valves were implanted is different to the way we currently implant them. You know, the coplanar view versus the, uh, the cusp overlay view, which 
gives you a shallower implant than for the lower rate of pacemaker. So that may change. But one thing, one thing that I did note, which was interesting, was the very high rate of atrial fibrillation in the surgical cohort compared to the TAVR cohort. And I wonder if that also has something to do with late events. So we're looking and at 13 percent versus 40 percent yes, in the exactly. SAVR. It is, it is a big difference. It is a big difference. And the other thing is, and I think this may be the underlying reason, I'm just speculating here on the difference in mortality that continues to to uh, diverge as the study goes on is the patient prosthesis mismatch, which was uh, substantially higher in the surgical group compared to the uh, Evolute group, which is, as we all know, a superannular valve. So the degree of moderate to severe patient mismatch was 9% uh, uh, in the uh, TAVR group versus 25% in the surgical group. And you just wonder if that may be the underlying driver for uh, the, the better survival curve of TAVR with time. Perhaps. And I think what it does teach us, though, is that the first implant is critical um, and patient prosthesis mismatch probably should not be tolerated as much as we used to tolerate it uh, in the pre-TAVR era. And I think surgeons should be looking at annular expansion and root expansion uh, at the initial implant. Yeah, I think that's very important. Thank you, Dr. Shaby, and thank you to our Radcliffe Cardiology viewers. This was a quick summary of some of the interventional trials presented here at ACC 2023.